So hi everyone, good morning. This is another day of uh, EuroPython. And uh, we're starting the with a talk uh, of Chin. Uh, hi Chin. Uh, good morning. Hello. How are morning. you? No, doing okay. Well, because I'm the first to start, so let's see how I do. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I don't you... know whether I should stand or sit. Where are you streaming from? Well, I'm streaming from Singapore. Oh, and how's the weather here, there? Very, very hot. I mean, I mean uh, global warming is taking a hit upon us. The same too here in Athens. <laughs> yeah, but we're not talking about the weather today. <laughs> so... uh... <laughs> Uh, okay, if you are ready, we can uh, start, uh, first of all. Okay, so um, hello everyone. Uh, today I will be sharing about like how do we design functional data pipelines for reproducibility and maintainability using some functional programming features in Python. First, a bit about myself, um, I'm Chin Hui. Uh, I'm a data engineer at DT1. Uh, so what we do is that we actually provide like, we actually provide a bunch of services such that people from emerging economies can stay connected with their loved ones. And yeah, I came from, a, I, so I, before I joined the data engineering, I actually have a background in aerospace engineering and computational modeling. And outside of my work, I do speak at conferences and occasionally I do write about data processing. So if you'd like to follow along, you could actually look at the slides that I have, that I have on this link. So as a data engineer, what we typically do is that we build data pipelines. So when we talk about like when we talk about the data pipelines, we're thinking about all, of, all those complex data pipelines all flying around. But we can, but then when, but then fundamentally, we need to look at like the basic design pattern of a data pipeline which have like a function, like an operation, and then you have a target output. So in this case, right, we are actually having a square and then I would like to do this operation such that I have a circle that fits the square. And then my output will be the square and the circle that fits the square. So that is like a basic structure of a data pipeline. So it looks pretty easy, like whereby we have an input and then we finish through a process and then we have an output. But in reality, when we are designing a data pipeline at scale, it gets a bit more tricky because we would need to consider like three key factors. So firstly, we need to be reliable. The data pipeline needs to be reliable. So what does this mean is that the data pipeline must produce the desired output, when, which brings us to the point of reproducibility. It has to be scalable. So what does it mean is that the data pipeline must be able to run independently across multiple nodes. So why do we need to consider that? Is because like typically, that, like if we have a data pipeline and we want to be able to run across multiple nodes, then it needs to be able to be run independently across multiple nodes across like multiple regions. And this brings us to the concept of parallelism. Last but not least, the data pipeline has to be extensible because we need to be, because as, we, as the business logic evolves, we need to be able to extend the data pipeline with changing business logic, such as when we have a new feature, we need to be able to, we need to be able to add that logic more easily. So this brings us to the concept of like code maintainability. So let me elaborate a little bit about some challenges in designing data pipelines at scale. So let's so let's go to the example of like reproducibility during testing. So and let's say like you know we need to be able to like know whether a customer is trustworthy based on certain like customer credit rating so when we have a loan right we need to process a loan so we need to be we need to be sure that the, the customer right has a good a positive credit rating before we approve the loan so in the, in so in this case right let's say like now like at time t uh, i process this i process all those data and I approve for the loans. And I, and then I need to ensure that two months later, when I need to like audit all those approvals for compliance reasons, I need to ensure that like with the same set of data in the data source, with the same competition logic, I need to be able to get the same result for my target. So 
Uh, yeah, so you need same data source, same composition logic, and then I process it at time t. I process it at time like like t plus two plus two months later. I need to get the same result. So the main challenge is that when we want to be able to like test for the reproducibility, we want to design for reproducibility during testing. We need to consider two so two different two different systems the data pipeline design. So first is the data source, and second is the computation logic. So those two dependencies affect what, what you get from the target in the target. So the main challenge that we have is that given the same data source, how do we ensure that we replicate the same result every time we rerun the same process, whether is it like at this point in time or whether is it two months later? So it has to be the same result. So now that we now that they say we have the data pipeline and we actually like ensure that it works during testing, it, then we need to ensure that we still have the reproducibility in production. So and so this brings us to the concept of like parallelism across multiple nodes in the case of like a sales transaction. So typically we have a sales transaction, right? We will need to compute our margins. And then, and then, like, and then we will actually like to collect all collect all the information into a target source. So in this, so in this scenario, right? Because each row in the transaction, each row transaction, is independent of each other. That's why we can actually chunk the sales transaction into independent chunks, compute the margins, and then collect the results. Into a single into into a collection of targets, but then it's then we need to also consider the fact that it may not be that simple, depending on how depending on the dependencies in the data pipeline. So, for example, in the case of trying in the case of trying to check whether you have enough balance for the transaction. So imagine that at time t, I have a so I have a transaction which required with I have a transaction for a certain amount. And now I need to check whether there is enough balance in the inventory. So I need to be able to keep track of the balance, like whether there's enough balance in the inventory in the first place before I approve the transaction. So imagine I have another, I have another transaction, right? Which may be smaller or which may be larger than the, than the earlier transaction. But then whether we have enough balance in the inventory depends on when the transaction is actually made. So if, if, so if I swap the order, right, then like, I need to, then the inventory balance actually changes according to time. So we have this problem of, you know, do we have enough balance? And what exactly is the inventory balance at, at the point of time? Because whether we have enough balance for like, those transaction depends on when the when we, when the transaction is actually being made. So it's actually it's actually affected by the time. And we need to know like what is the current state of the data source at a particular time. And this actually introduces some problems in terms of like debugging parallel current code, concurrent code at runtime due to the shared state because we have this shared state called inventory and. In this case, how do we know like what is the current state of the data source? Because it depends on what like the time. So the main challenge is that how do we design data pipelines that run the same competition logic across multiple nodes and reproduce predictable results every time? Because if I, if we if we have a case whereby we are not able to like have predict the result every time because of some randomness in the process in the process introduced by time, then how do we actually ensure that we are, we are getting, getting results that are predictable every single time we run the pipeline? Now we, are, now we look at the second, second aspect in terms of the challenges designing a data pipeline, which is the problem of maintainability during debugging. So, it's a, so this is a really this is a typical scenario of you know works in testing, breaks in production. Why is it this case? Why is it so? Because while the code works in testing, typically when we write tests, we are actually looking at a subset of the data source. And when, when then when, and then this does and this in this subset 
may not be fully representative of the actual data in production. So when so this this so this 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 leads to the issue of like, having edge cases and inefficiencies that are not detected in your test cases, which are, which actually cause the performance issues and failures in production because you because it can't be detected during testing. And when and when the situation of like having issues during production happens. This actually introduces some, it introduces some complexities in debugging and logging, especially when running on a parallel cluster. Because, typi because, there's, because typically for logging solutions, they don't really work very well in a parallel cluster situation. And it's not, it's not, it's not exactly very possible for you to keep track of like, what is exactly happening in each node when you are actually, like, when you are actually running your pipeline in production. And this is this actually will co like, cause like a lot of like inefficiencies in developer productivity. And so the challenge is that how do we design data pipelines that are readable and maintainable at its core to reduce inefficiencies in production debugging at scale? Because, it, because we know that it is going to there's, there's some limitations in trying to debug and log log a, log a pipeline that is running in, in a parallel cluster. So we need to be sure that we can actually understand the logic of the pipeline on the code itself. And last but not least, we need to understand that like, like, whenever, like, whenever we try to add new features to a code base, the code reasoning actually becomes more challenging with increasing code complexity. And this is to be expected because as our business evolves and grows, they will keep having new features, and we need to keep adding new features to be able to adapt to the adapt to the business requirements. And if we keep having adding all those business requirements without being very careful about how we manage how we manage the addition of new features, it comes to the risk of introducing unintended behavior due to some dependencies that may not be well documented and managed during during development. And so the challenge is that how do we design data pipelines that adapts well to changing business and technical requirements and at the same time ensures developer productivity so that we don't end up introducing unintended dependencies that are hard to debug. And so this brings me to the concept of like viewing data pipelines as functions. And this, and this also brings us to the paradigm of functional programming. So what is functional programming? So functional programming is actually a declarative style of programming that emphasizes writing software using only one, two functions, and two immutable values. So what do I, so, so there are actually three key principles of functional programming that we need to be aware of. Number one, pure, we use pure functions and we avoid side effects. Secondly, we need to ensure some immutability property. And last but not least, which is the most important of most important principle of functional programming is the concept of referential transparency, which I will elaborate later. So firstly, about pure functions and avoiding side effects. So what is a pure function? So a pure function is such that the output depends on one, the input, number two, internal algorithm, and pretty much nothing else. And secondly, a pure function must not have any side effects as illustrated in this diagram. And what is the implication of the concept of a pure function is that a output depends only on its input parameters and its internal algorithms, and there are no side effects, which, lead, which means that we have, if we have the same function and the same input parameter x, we will get the same result regardless of the number of invocations. An example of a pure function is, let's say we are making pizza. And then we have the dough, we have the tomatoes, we have the ingredients, and yeah, we also have the pineapples. We put them together, and then we make it into we make it into a nice pizza layout. We put it in the oven. We have some temperature. We have some time, and then ideally, we should be able to get a, a nicely cooked pizza. So this is what. So this is a, an example of a pure function. In reality, making pizza is an impure function, and it is inevitable that we will end up making pizza with side effects. So what do I mean by, by, by that is that because making pizza will actually cause certain side effects other than baking the pizza. 
So it could be in the form of radiation heat. So that's something that is not, in, that is not intended in the budget. And it could also be a case whereby when you keep reusing your oven, and when even though you are setting at 160 degrees Celsius, but your oven is actually cooking the pizza at 180 degrees Celsius, so you end up with a side effect of an oven overheat and you end up with a burnt pizza. Um, with, this, with this pizza analogy, um, let's, let's look at what exactly do we mean by a side effect. So formally, a function with side effects changes the outside the local function scope, which is this case is the oven. So some examples would be you are modifying a variable in place, or you are modifying a global state, or it could be I/O operation, or even showing exception of the error in the case of um, in the case of like the burnt pizza. Now, secondly, we look back at the concept of immutability. So what do I mean by immutability? It means that when once I define a variable, if I try to assign another value to that same variable, I am going to get an assignment error. So that is not allowed. It means that the state of the variable cannot be changed once a value is assigned to a variable. And the key implication of the concept of immutability is that it enables us to enforce some discipline in state management especially when we are trying to ensure that the input of the input of the data pipeline is not altered upon, in, upon initiation. And this will actually prevent the side effect resulting from state change of whatever, whatever data input that you have in the pipeline, which is related to the concept of ensuring that your function remains pure. The key implication of the concept of immutability is the ease of writing parallel and concurrent programs. Because now that you do not, you, not that you do not need to keep track of what is happening to, in terms of the state change or whatever input data you have, and you're sure that the, the, the input data will not be changed. Hence, parallel, hence, it is easier for us to be able to parallelize all those input data and safety and, and safety parallelize those operations and then gather those set of set of results and collect them. Ensure and, and we can ensure that there is no state changes that we need to worry about. Secondly, and okay, so we also look at we look at the concept of referential transparency. So referential transparency means that like, let's say if I have a function that I have a function which is equal to some operation. I can actually I can actually interchange both the function and the operation. And the formal definition of referential transparency is that a function is referential trans referentially transparent when an expression can be substituted by its equivalent algorithm without affecting the program logic for all programs. And some conditions for referential, referential transparency is that number one, it has to be a pure function. And number two, it has to be deterministic, which means that the expression always returns the same output given the same input without any random, random factors. So what do I mean by deterministic versus non-deterministic? So what do we mean by non-deterministic is that, let's say, you know, we have a bread and put it in the oven, right? And then we expect toast. So by right, if, it's a, if, the, if the operation is deterministic, we should be getting toast every single time. But another deterministic operation is such that instead of getting toast, at some random time, I end up getting burnt toast, which is not toast. So that means that my output depends on the time, which is not deterministic. Yeah. The last condition for referential transparency is that the function has to be idempotent which means that the expression can be multi applied multiple times without changing the result beyond its initial application. And the illustration of idempotence is that is, for example, the absolute function, whereby once I apply the absolute function on a number, a negative number, when I keep applying the same operation multiple times, I still get the same result as the initial ap application. And the, and the key consequence of referential transparency is equational reason which means that the expression can be replaced with its equivalent result, as shown in the example. And now that I've talked about those key principles of functional programming, let's go on to the concept that to how do we actually write control flow in functional programming. 
So the key, so the key principle of how do we write functional control flow is through the concept of functional composition, whereby which can be illustrated in the following example. So let's say I have x and I feed it through f, feed it through a function f, and I feed it through a function g, and then you I can actually express that as a comp, uh, like a composite function. Second, and we need to understand that in Python, functions are first-class objects, which means that a function can be, number one, assigned to the variable, number two, a pass as a parameter to other functions, and return as a value from other functions. And a key consequence of first-class functions is that we can actually make you, we can actually write higher-order functions. And a higher-order function has at least one of these properties. Either it accepts functions as parameters, or it returns a function as a value. And in Python, we also have the concept of anonymous functions, also known as lambda expressions in Python, whereby we use the function as input without defining the name function object, as shown in this code snippet. And now that we actually talk about function composition and how it is being expressed as higher order functions in Python, now we can go on to like some key higher order functions in Python. So for example, is map, whereby I have a bunch of shapes, I can map with an operation, and then I get an output. So let's say if I want to, I want to add smiley faces to the shape, I have other shapes, I feed it into the map, map add smiley face function operation, and then I'm going to map each shape with the add smiley face operation. And then after that, I collect all those results as a set of as a set of shapes with smiley faces. The filter operation is, where is the, as for the filter operation, what it does is that it filters a set of elements which fulfills the, so a certain condition. So in this case, we filter, we only select those shapes which has finite edges. And as for reduce, we, what we have is that we actually like reduce them into a single output as in this example. And how do we actually, and how do we actually like apply that filter and how do we compare it to for loop? So the key difference is that for for loops, we need to manage the state changes of a whole bunch of, uh, of a whole bunch of mutable variables in a for loop, such as I had, such as like the squared, not squared variable. But for the map function, we do not need to manage state changes. And when we talk about functional control flow, I also need to talk about recursion as a form of functional iteration, because recursion is a form of self-referential functional composition, which takes the results of itself as inputs into an instance of itself. However, if we don't, if we don't have a, we, however, if we don't have an end, right, then it's going to have an infinite recursive loop condition. So to prevent this scenario from happening, a base case is required as a terminating condition. So it's so it's such that we have a, a, a recursive call stack whereby I have this operation which calls which calls another instance of the operation and it goes all the way to the base case. So if you look at the call, recursive call stack and you compare it to iterative load, so that is so there is this difference. And because we want and because we can because what will happen is that. When you keep building up the recursive calls that it can get a little bit too heavy if you have so many so many calls in the iteration. Hence, we have the concept of tail call optimization, which aims to reduce calls, the stack frame consumption in the call stack. So what it does is that it looks it looks for a tail call which does nothing other than retaining the value of the functional call, and then it compiles them to iterative loops, such as in this scenario. So in, you, so if you look at this, so when you look at this tail optimization example, it identifies an instance of a, an instance that keeps being repeated on the call stack as the tail call. And then with that, it compiles the, the recursion as an iterative loop in the compiler. So now that we have talked about some like functional control loops and some principles, now we can go into the functional design patterns for data pipeline design in Python. So firstly, we have built-in higher order functions. In the, in, a, in the case of, in the, so we have map filter, and we also have list comprehensions. 
So if you look at this example, you realize that these corporations are actually synthetic sugar for map filter operations in the data collection. And how we use map filter in data transformation is that we actually like, we actually filter certain certain inputs, and then we map certain and then we map what the whatever values that are being filtered with an operation. So it's just something like this example. And the benefits of using map filter in data transformation is that we can keep the data and the transformation logic separate, which enables improved code visibility with better transfer transparency of transformation logic, such that we can apply the transformation logic to another, another, another instance of the data or in, an, in, a, in another use case. And we can actually extend the concept of map filter to parallel and concurrent programming. So, so it could use multiprocessing. You could also use concurrent futures, which I've actually talked about in an earlier talk. On, so you can look at this example. Yeah, so in this example, right, I'm actually using multiprocessing.pool to generate an iterator using map, and then we filter the results to a collection. So if you want to find out a bit more about how we use concurrent futures for parallel or concurrent programming, you can check out my Europython talk on speed up your data processing. Okay, second, this about the immature data structures in Python. So for immature data structures, once it is created, it cannot be changed. And the benefits of using immutable data structures is that it is number one, easier to reason, because what you see is what you get. Number two, it is easier to test because you worry about the logic, not the state, because you can't change the state. And because you can't keep, you can't change the state, it ensures that your, your whatever data pipeline you design with the data structure is thread safe, which is easier for parallelism. Now, instead of using a list, which is mutable, we can use tuple, which, which if you try to do the same thing as what I did for the list, you will end up having a type error. So instead of using a class to define a point or a dictionary, we could use a name tuple, whereby when you try to do a similar operation, you will get an attribute error because you're not allowed to modify a, modify a, a new name tuple that has already been assigned to, uh, that has already had the value assigned. Although you can actually use a replace operation, but what it does is that it creates a new instance of the points of the point object. So you're not exactly modifying the original object. And I think the, I think this is the part whereby it gets really more interesting. And it's actually a Python 10, 3.10 feature that's inspired by similar syntax of Scala, which is structural pattern matching. That is especially useful for conditional matching of data structure patterns. So how do we add, so what is structural pattern matching? So it is actually characterized by the match case syntax. If I if we if I have a certain case, we do something. So that's so you know that you know that this code snippet is actually inspired by whatever syntax that is being used as Scala. So uh, so this so this is more of like a code snippet to actually give a rough idea of how structural pattern matching can be used. So for instance, if I want to be able to check whether the instance is a like let's say a variable it belongs to a certain type. So if I use the if edit else right, so you can see that I keep I have to use the if instance function. So it can get a little bit messy compared with using a match case. Whereby I am actually look like I'm actually like if it was I'm actually doing like like do it like doing certain operations based on certain cases, like certain characteristics of what is being matched. And why do we want why and why why do I suggest using pattern matching is that it ensures maintainability of data schema. And and so this can be actually illustrated in this following example of you that I use. Based on a based on a code that code snippet that I use as Scala. So for the purpose of the well, for the purpose of this of this talk, I actually use data classes as the Python equivalent of Scala data classes. So in this case, you can see that I'm actually matching like, the variable matching the variable request 
according to certain characteristics. And a little short note about the recursion in Python is that tail core optimization is not supported in Python. So optimization, unfortunately, has to be implemented manually. And on top of that, we need to consider that there is a recursion limit of 1,000 by default as a prevention mechanism against call stack overflow in the C Python implementation. So, those, so that's a small note about recursion in Python. And last one, and, and, and I need to mention about type systems because because this is an important part of functional programming. And Python does have support for type hints, although it's not exactly enforced in runtime. And we can actually make use of type checking with MyPy to enforce a certain level of type systems in Python. And, the, and why I advocate using type, type systems for part of your code when you are writing functional code is that it prevents bugs at runtime by ensuring type safety and consistency across the data pipeline. So that we know exactly what is the type of the input and what is the type of the output. And also, I, I, after I talked about all those features of functional programming that can be done in Python, can we write a purely functional data pipeline in Python? Turns out, not really, because we need to consider that IO operations are still needed for reading and writing data outside of the application domain. Hence, there's, hence there's this pattern, there's this design pattern of a functional call and imperative shell, such that we are keeping the core domain, lo domain logic and the infrastructure code separate. So we have the core domain logic in the functional core, and, we, and for those IO operations and of like that are, inter that are interfacing the infrastructure, we will keep it separate in the imperative shell. So if you'd like to find out a bit more about this design pattern, you can refer to a PyCon 2020 talk on boundaries. So an example of how I use this design pattern is in this code snippet, whereby I have an IO layer to delete the data. I have a functional layer for computation logic. And finally, an IO layer to write the data outside of the program. So the key takeaways that I'd like you to take, take with you is that with that we should adopt functional design patterns when designing data pipelines at scale, especially for parallel and distributed workflows. And the, and the reason for that is that we want to be ensured that whatever pipelines that we design are, are reproducible, scalable, and maintainable. And on top of adopting functional design patterns in the core logic, we need to also spend, we also need to consider the use of a functional core in predictive shell design pattern to manage the side effects separately from the data pipeline logic. And now, and this, is the end, this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. And you can reach out to me by uh, following social media links and also check out my ongoing series on functional programming at the following link. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have uh, time for a Q and A. Uh, you can always continue your uh, your discussion to the breakout room. And uh, okay, I think now we have a break.